first, I, would, I really would like to thank uh, Kate and the folks at Landmark West for allowing me to gas bag about something that I really enjoy doing on a daily basis. And I guess one of the questions I would ask is, are there brownstone homeowners here? Any? My thoughts and prayers are with you. <laughs> um, it's it's a it's a difficult material to preserve, and um, in my 35 years in the in the business, I would say it's the, the addressing conservation issues with brownstone are are some of the more interesting things that we've done in our office. So, in any case, let me. Um, can we go for it? We, we unfortunately have that wonderful promise of technology, but we've got a Rube Goldbergian system working here. Um, so brownstone. Uh, when we're talking about brownstone in New York City, we're essentially talking about Portland, Connecticut brownstone. Portland, Connecticut actually was called Chatham before they started really hauling a lot of stone out of the ground, and it, at which point they determined that they would change the name of the town to Portland because Portland, England had some fantastic uh, limestone. In any case, Portland, Connecticut stone is the most prevalent stone used in New York City and, and actually on the East Coast. Um, the 1880 census determined that 90% of the stone buildings in New York City were constructed of sandstone and 80% of those were constructed of brownstone. In Brooklyn, 90% of the buildings were constructed of brownstone. And this, of course, was, was from the 1850s into the 1890s, the Gothic Revival period. However, in the 18th century, there was a considerable amount of stone used as trim. This is a, a building in Newport, Rhode Island. Uh, St. Mary's Church in Newport is also constructed of brownstone, but it was essentially used as, as trim. They were taking Portland, Connecticut brownstone out of the quarries in the mid-18th century. And here in the city, uh, 1766, St. Paul's downtown was built of Portland brownstone. Uh, Church of the Ascension, one of our long-term clients, this is a Richard Upjohn building, 1841 in Manhattan. And Trinity Church, of course, is another Upjohn Church um, in 1846 was constructed of Portland, Connecticut brownstone. Uh, one of my favorites is the Cooper Union, which um, I'll have a little tale about this later when we talk about how this material disintegrates. Cooper Union was also clad in uh, <coughs> Portland, Connecticut brownstone. Now. Where does this stuff come from? When, when the folks at Landmarks West asked me to speak about this, one of the things they asked me was to talk about the deterioration of it. And to understand the modes of deterioration of stone, you need to understand the origins of it and, and essentially how it's formed and what it's formed of. So essentially the, the Portland, Connecticut brownstone that we get to play with is from the late Triassic, early Jurassic period. That's uh, 200 million years ago. And it is a sedimentary material, which essentially means that it is laid down, it, it gravity pulls it down into layers, and it's metamorphosed into a stone. Um, at one point, there was that Cretaceous Sea this is 79, 80 million years ago, which carried all of these wonderful particulates that came out in the form of lava, metamorphosed into granite, and then these things were picked up and carried by wind, they were carried by water. The Jurassic Sea covered most of the southwest. You see some of the most amazing formations of sandstone in the southwest that you can imagine. Um, there are other uh, elements from the Jurassic and Triassic period um, that remain with us in other locations. I want you to look into this stone's eyes and remember what I'm going to tell you. Stone weathering is a natural and irreversible phenomenon caused by the continuous interaction of stone and the environment. 
It's a phenomenon that is natural and irreversible. How this one has lasted this long is amazing. <laughs> but I want you to remember what I've just said, because that's what happens to stone. So again, sandstone's a sedimentary, clastic stone. Clastic means that it wasn't formed from organic materials. It was formed from, from inorganic materials, essentially quartzite, feldspar, things that were metamorphosed, mixed up in the wind, mixed up in the water, and then deposited in layers in other areas. You know, unlike limestone, which is essentially calcium from sea creatures, from shells. This is a completely inorganic material. I'm not going to bore you with this one too much, but there's our sedimentary stone. We start out with magma and lava. It gets metamorphosed into igneous rocks. They get ground up. They get played around with by water or air, and they get laid down in sediments, and that's what we're left with. Now, our sediments of granitious material are, are cemented essentially together by either calcareous material or by clays, very, very fine pieces of, of clay material. And what we get to play with is from a wonderful formation that runs down through, actually starts up in, in Massachusetts with East Longmeadow uh, brownstone, runs all the way down through Newark. There were quarries in Newark. They're covered by housing projects now. There are several buildings in New York that use the Newark uh, basin material. But what we mostly play with is the brownstone from Portland, Connecticut. There's an old image of the quarry, and in that quarry, you can see in the background, essentially, the outcroppings of the brownstone. It's yeah. estimated that in the 1880s, over 5 million cubic yards of sandstone was quarried from the Portland, Connecticut quarries. Again, you can see the sediment layers. One of the great things about the sediment layers is that the, that nature, that natural nature of the stone to lay down in layers makes it much easier to quarry the stone in horizontal layers and, and get sheets of what eventually became veneer on the buildings that, that we're looking at. Very few of the buildings that are created of stone are large bearing wall stones. They're veneer on some other sort of backup. In this image, and I hope it's clear enough to you, you can actually see the sediment layers. This is a sample that we got from the Portland, Connecticut <coughs> quarries, which were reopened uh, a couple of decades ago, stayed open for a while. Um, Portland, Connecticut supplied the, the redo for the Cooper Union building. Um, but it's, a, it's essentially a, a layered stone, and that becomes very important in understanding the performance of this material. Why is it brown? Well, there is a compound called hematite, which is a byproduct of limonite when it, when it reacts with the atmosphere that causes it to oxidize. And when that material oxidizes, it turns into a ferrous material, which turns it brown. And one of the things that you will see, even in the Portland, Connecticut quarry, and I think I have a, a good slide showing uh, some real variations, Within the same quarry, you can get several different appearances of stone. Um, you, you see in the upper right, there's actually a lot of mica in that particular sample. And the mica is what, when you look at a brownstone building that hasn't been covered with the smear of stucco, you can actually see those wonderful, sparkly, diamond-like appearances of the stone. So all of these samples came from the same quarry. This is important to understand because when you're dealing with the stone later on, one of the things that you have to understand is you might be dealing with a part of the quarry that did not have great stone in it. So this is sandstone from Haverstraw, New York. Each one of these pieces, I mean, remarkable difference in the color of these things. They all came from the same quarry in Haverstraw, New York. Part of the vein that came down through Connecticut, but quarried out of, out of Haverstraw. So during the 1850 to the 1880 period, it was, the, the, it was called the Brownstone Era. Um, and there were 1,500 men 
working in the Portland quarries. And, and when you consider the, so the size of the town of Portland, that's a very large sector of the population, 1,500 men working in these quarries. There was a fleet of 30 ships that was continually bringing brownstone down the Connecticut River. As I said, most of the stone found on our houses is veneer, and what that means is sheets of brownstone that are sometimes six, I've never seen them more than eight inches thick. And, and that's important to understand too because that affects how and, and to what extent we can use the stone again or need to replace it. So how do we get from rock in the quarry to the stone? And Andra, Andra was very prescient in, in asking me to sort of explain how these things come about and explain about the, the workers in these quarries too because it really was an amazingly um, arduous type of work, very dangerous. You can see this looks like it might be sort of a miniature town, but when you look at the top of the quarry, you can see a house up there. You see how far down into the ground they were getting this stuff, and all of this stuff was being <coughs> quarried and hauled out by hand. Uh, the large blocks were cut away with feather and wedge. Essentially what they would do is drill a small hole in the ground, then put a, a spike that had two flanges on the side of it and continue to continually drive it down into the stone until the piece broke away. 1,500 men extracting stone from the, the Portland, Connecticut quarries. And I have a quote, a newspaper quote from the 1880s that I want to read to you that is, is really kind of poignant. The men worked with hand tools in the open with no safety equipment using only hammers, picks, crowbars, and sledgehammers, forcing the stone from the rock beds. Imagine the effort of swinging a large sledgehammer all day. Now, sometimes I gripe about having to walk upstairs and get a cup of coffee. It was often said that you would never see an overweight quarryman, and the hard physical labor ensured that that was the case. Just imagine waking up every day knowing that you were going to be swinging a sledgehammer all day six days a week, not five. So we got the stone out of the ground. Then the stone was, was roughly dressed. And, and this is an important point because this affects the performance of the brownstone in New York. It was set out to season. It was set out usually for a year because there was a, a considerable amount of water in the quarries and brownstone being somewhat porous would actually absorb a lot of that quarry water. If that quarry water wasn't able to be extracted from the stone naturally, it stayed in the stone and that caused problems. So the next step was seasoning and then the stone would be brought to the site where it would be finally dressed. And, and again, I want you to remember that typically the brownstone was installed on buildings as a veneer five and six inches thick. This is a piece of, of Portland when the quarry was still open and unfortunately it's been closed again. Uh, we were able to get considerable amounts of stone. So we'll talk about the physical properties because this is where we get into the fun part. This is the, the playground part of talking about brownstone. As I said, there, there were two types of water formed and, and and air form, terrigenous form. This is a, a column from the New York State Capitol. And you can see very clearly, I think, the sediment layers in this, in this column. This stone is from East Longmeadow, Massachusetts. This quarry is, is still actually active and you can get stone from East Longmeadow. Thank you, Andrew. It's easily worked. It's pretty easily transported, very easily carved, although eventually it will case harden. It will, in, in um, exposure to oxygen, just like marble, it will actually form a very hard skin. Um, but it's not without its flaws. It can be worked and, and tooled in many, many different ways, making very interesting uh, surface articulation. So what happened? Well, we, we can start right here. Uh, remember one of the things I told you was that the stone is relatively absorptive. 
and if it was not allowed to season properly, it would be installed on a building with water still in the mix. The water is still in the stone. If you install it in the summer and it's wet, when winter comes around and that water in the stone freezes, then you begin to have problems. This problem is, is actually multiple, and I want to point out something. One of the things that occurred with this stone, which is unfortunate, is that it was repointed with a very hard Portland cement mortar. Originally, originally the stone was set with a high lime rich mortar, which is actually relatively flexible. It has the same modul modulus of elasticity, if not less, than the stone to which it's attached. So it could move. The stones could expand and contract and there wouldn't be issues. When you put a material like Portland cement onto it, which is very rigid and hydrous, once that brownstone expands a little bit, the brownstone is actually weaker than the Portland cement and the brownstone begins to crack. That's an issue. So when you have a contractor who tells you he wants to repoint your brownstone building with Portland cement, tell him to um, find somewhere else to work nicely. So here's the menu from hell. These are all the things that can affect the performance of brownstone. I'm not going to read them to you, but take a look. If anybody has a question about any of these things, um, we can talk about it after, I guess, sure. unless you want them to yell yeah, now, that's, now, that's fine. Mm -hmm. um, but in any case, um, bad workmanship, you know, one of the things that can happen is, is a piece can be damaged because this is a sedimentary material. If you drop it, you can cause microfissuring between the layers of sediment and the sediment and the cementing material. So it, it's actually a relatively fragile material in that, in that case. Um, again, one of the things that I'll talk about is the, the poor workmanship that took place at the Cooper Union in the 1950s. So all of these things, this, this menu really is, is the, the list of some of the worst things that can happen to brownstone. Now, an important situation is what we call placing of the stone either as face bedded or quarry bedded. And what you see here are some quarry bedded stones and some face bedded stones. Quarry bedded stones are those that are set on the building with the same orientation that they have in the quarry. Face bedding, although it's cosmetically nicer looking, involves the setting of the stones so that those sediment layers are facing the exterior of the building. The stone is weaker in this orientation, of course, because it's got very high compressive strength very low tensile strength. In this situation, those sediment layers are actually being asked to support weight from above. That becomes an issue, among other things. Face bedding versus quarry bedding. And this is probably the primary issue that we have with uh, brownstone buildings in New York City. Most of them were, uh, the brownstone was stall, installed face bedded. Here's a little illustration that I tried to, uh, to give for you. I hope this explains. And one of the other issues, of course, is that water coming from above and water being introduced to the stone through capillary action actually then can get between the layers of sediment and it can affect the cementing material. Typical issue with face bedded stone. This is a wall again in, in Newport, Rhode Island, where the material was face bedded. It began to, to, to delaminate because at the bottom, because of capillary action bringing water up through the stone, and extremely inappropriately, what this owner did was apply a Portland cement base to try and keep the water out. Well, all that does is make all the water go up behind it. So we actually exacerbated the condition by installing a Portland cement base here.
salts in the stone can be an issue. Salts in the mortar can be an issue. And here you see the, the Montauk Club in Brooklyn. And when you see the salts recrystallizing on the surface of the stone, it's called efflorescence. It's cosmetically not desirable, but it doesn't really harm the stone. Where it can become a problem is if the salt in the stone through either case hardening of the, of the surface or any other situation, when the salts that are, that are super saturated in the water in the stone then dry out behind that case hardening, they'll pop the surface of the stone off. That's called cryptofluorescence. You have efflorescence on the surface, cryptofluorescence beneath the surface. As I said, uh, Brownstone is, is absorptive, it's porous and absorptive. When the stone is carved, there is much more exposure to the sediment layers as you, as you go around contours. And, and so it's, it's almost rare not to see carved brownstone that hasn't had to have some kind of repair over the years. Some of the other things that occur, of course, acid rain. We, in the 1880s up through probably the 1950s, we were burning coal. Coal has sulfur. When the sulfur rains on a brownstone building, it creates acid. When the acid is absorbed into the stone, it causes delamination um, like you can't believe. It's un this is the uh, Church of the Incarnation. All of these stones had to be replaced. Soil, dry soil deposition. It doesn't seem like a, a major issue in general. Okay, it's dirty, so what? Well, what that soot does is then attracts acidic materials from the atmosphere, and when it gets rained on, it absorbs that material, and then that causes uh, disaggregation of the material on the wall. Biological issues. When there is moss or lichen on a, on a piece of brownstone, that gets absorbed into the pores of the brownstone. The digestive process of lichen and the digestive process of moss creates sugars, which are acidic. And those sugars in the pores of the brownstone begin to enlarge the pores. They also expand, and they can pop the surface of the brownstone off. Another menu of the, of the uh, biological actions that can affect. When I say higher plants, um, I'm sure we've all seen trees growing out of wash surfaces on brownstone buildings. It's just amazing. And I threw animals in there just because I hate squirrels. <laughs> so, um, people who know me know that that one of my favorite quotes, and I don't know where the origin of this is, is that the two worst enemies of historic buildings are water and stupid men. <laughs> and in the stupid man category, I've already explained a little bit about the water. The stupid man category, one of the things that I mentioned earlier was the Cooper Union. In the 1950s, they did a restoration of the Cooper Union, which involved retooling most of the surface of that building with jackhammers not by hand, but with jackhammers. And what those hydraulic jackhammers did and those air jackhammers did was cause a considerable amount of micro-fissuring of the remaining layers of stone. Remember, if you bash on something that's layers of hard material joined by softer material, something is going to give. And so what they actually did was exacerbated the condition on that building by using jackhammers to retool it. Thus. 30 years later, the building had gone for a hundred and how many years before they had deterioration. 30 years later, they had to redo the whole thing. So you see on the lower right-hand corner, again, a stucco patch on a building. This is an East Longmeadow uh, <coughs> brownstone building that's been patched with Portland cement that has been uh, pigmented. Well, if you attach a piece of material that's completely anhydrous won't absorb water, won't let water pass through it. Then when water gets into the stone around it, it can't evaporate this way, so it's going to find other places to evaporate. So we end up, again, exacerbating the condition by performing 
of repair. Uh, again, more, more uh, face bedded stone. This at the base of a building, all of the deterioration that's occurring here is caused by capillary action of water being sucked out of the ground into this stone. Salts, again, capillary action from uh, splashback on the sidewalk and when you introduce de-icing salts to your sidewalk, what you do is create a new problem. You create a new path for salt to enter the different sheets of the brownstone, thereby causing delamination of the stone. So just something as simple as de-icing your sidewalk can cause problems with this. Salt gets into the pores, salt recrystallizes. As it re recrystallizes, it expands. Kiss of death for any kind of soft stone. All of the issues with this column base are water-based problems. So, swelling with water. Of course, once water gets into the material, and if it gets into a clay binder, everyone knows that one of the, one of the great materials um, is that we use for waterproofing cellars and foundations is bentonite. Everybody heard of bentonite? It's essentially clay between two layers of a fibrous paper. Once clay gets wet, it expands. So if you have brownstone, that where clay is the binder between the layers of the igneous stone, when that clay gets wet, it expands and causes delamination of the stone. If it's face bedded stone, you're losing the surface of your building. Freezing water, of course, water, water expands up to six times its original volume when it freezes. So we know that brownstone is porous. We know that it's absorptive. So when, it's, when water is in it, and it expands, we start to lose the surface of the stone. Uh, construction details. There's a nice mild iron cramp holding two pieces of stone together. And of course, what happens when, when iron or steel gets wet? It corrodes, it expands up to seven times its original volume. And when it's next to a piece of nice soft brownstone, we lose the brownstone. So here we have um, our buildings. They're constructed with a stone that is relatively fragile. Every issue that I've, I've mentioned can affect our buildings. Inappropriate treatments. Again, this is a, a surface of a building that um, <laughs> they've, they've sort of tried to make it look like the the uh, Lafitte Blacksmith House in New Orleans that has the faux missing stucco. The, the original issue here was that it was repointed inappropriately with Portland cement mortar and all of those pieces started to delaminate and then they had a contractor come back and soften the edges so it would actually look sort of romantic. Uh, it, it's, this is in Park Slope, it makes me gag every time I walk past this building. So what what our job is, what my job is as a design professional is to try as much as possible when we're looking at a building, a brownstone building, to determine what the causes of deterioration are. And, and typically it's not one thing. With a brownstone building, it's many. Um, and so this is sort of a list of things that we have to go through, sometimes using um, chemicals, sometimes using technology in order to establish an appropriate intervention. When I say an appropriate intervention, I, I would say that the most valuable member of an intervention team is a contractor who knows what he or she is doing and knows the material that they're working with. And I, I really have to say, when I, when I met Jack, um, I was absolutely amazed because it seemed that I had met the Michelangelo of brownstone. Everything that we talked about, he, he is a magnificent craftsperson. His, his folks do amazing work. Um, in any case, uh, Kate said something about 
uh, material being removed from buildings. And every time I, I go past projects like this, that, that stone that you see in the upper left, actually that damage, that separation of those sediment layers on that piece of stone was caused again by, well, you can see they went after part of the stone with a grinding wheel on the top, and they went after that stone itself with a jackhammer. And every time I walked past this site, again, I threw up in my mouth a little bit. Um, <laughs> on the lower right-hand side, um, you, you, see these, you see these things all over the city. And I, I just have to say, uh, I'm reminded of the, 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 there was some knucklehead general during the Vietnam War who said, in order to save the village, you have to destroy it. Um, every time I see a, a brownstone building undergoing something like that, I'm reminded of that. And, and I'm happy that there are people like Jack um, who can save the, the buildings for us. Thanks. The question is to what role does the Landmarks Commission play with the fact that you are as knowledgeable and uh, as curious as we would be uh, in knowing that the Commission is preventing the poor, the work of a contractor that does poor work. Uh, periodically I go with Jack as someone screaming that the work has been uh, done terribly and wants to know why. And uh, I don't have an answer. He does have an answer, but the work has already been done. So you, as one of the 11 commissioners, how do you educate the commission on work that is being um, done incorrectly? You're a troublemaker. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's a real question, no, as you know. No, absolutely. Um, one of the things, actually, that I have been asked to do is give a number of of talks like this to the staff because as as much as we hope that the staff at the commission is technically adept i can't say that they all are i know, you know many of the staff at the commission were former students of mine at columbia many of them went through design they went through through planning they didn't go through conservation if you're not a conservator you can only make guesses and and quite frankly I have to say that there, there are staff at the Landmarks Commission who are not necessarily technically adept. And so one of the things that I've been asked, Mark Silverman asked me to give some talks. I'm giving a talk about windows. I'm going to be giving a talk about brownstone. And all we can do is educate them because I know what you're talking about. And when Kate first talked to me about doing this thing, I had some of my University of Massachusetts students down here. And we were all appalled at some of the things that we saw on the Upper West Side that had, had somehow escaped the purview of the Landmarks Commission. And if you and ask Mark, by the way, you recently met with Mark, his, the staff is wonderful. I'm not the, saying they're not No, wonderful. no, 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 no. And the truth of the matter is they just aren't educated. Right, right. So they and, allow. And I know the materials. I know all the toys. I don't know policy. And so the, 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 the real responsibility, I as far as I'm concerned for the LPC, is that every staff person have some kind of technical exposure so that they're not just guessing. Thank you. I know well, thank works. you. I do, too. <laughs> I, do, I, I consider it my responsibility, actually. And no, I consider it your responsibility, too. I, I recently did a talk with them about metals because they don't, Set they were talking it, about, oh, we're going to have an ADD moment here. They were talking about what pressure was appropriate to use for water blasting of cast iron. No pressure, no water is good on cast iron. Once you remove the paint on cast iron, it begins to rust immediately. And if it rusts while it's still wet, then you've got a, a completely hellish situation on your hands. So they just, in some cases, don't know. Right. And, and, and I just want to say, Many of the staff from years ago either started out with less work, but there really was a difference where they could be counted on. And now uh, it's they're, they're they're beaten to death there. Yeah. 
totally woefully understand. All right, we have a few questions back yeah. here. So the newer Basin Brownstone, is that more prevalent uh, in certain decades of construction during the 19th century or in certain neighborhoods? I've, I've, neighborhoods? Seen, it, I've seen it most actually in the 40s and 50s, not so much later on. And, and it's, it it's not great stuff either. I'm sorry? More prevalent in certain neighborhoods than others? Well, because essentially we were downtown in the 1840s and most of the stuff is in that area. On a number of projects, I run into ancient layers of paint. Big Dawn is really technically adhered to brown snow, and there's always a judgment call. Can it be removed? The health benefits versus the damage in removing it. I know it's a complex subject. It is a complex subject. One, if, it, if, if it's really good paint and it's really tenacious, it can cause issues if any other portion of the system fails because if water gets in behind it and then it's permitted to freeze, you begin to delaminate the stone. It's because a sandstone like limestone is relatively porous, once it's painted, that paint gets into the pores. I've never seen a successful paint removal project that involved only surface treatment of the paint. You have to rehome the surface of the stone because there's always going to be some paint in those pores of the brownstone. You're going to have a, a, a surface that's not cosmetically beautiful. So it's hand, chemical and hand tool removal and that rehoming. Essentially. Thank you. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, like you said, most of the stuff that you did was important in that. Yeah. Are there any telltale characteristics of Portland and where was other stone coming yeah, Pretty much everywhere you look, it's Portland. Actually, everywhere you look in New York City, 90% of the time now, what you're looking at is stucco because they've done the schmear, you know, the giant schmear of, of Portland cement, and then it's painted or they, they put a, another brown stucco over it. Sometimes they carve joint lines in it. Sometimes they don't even bother to do that. The, the Newark stone is typically, you're, you're able to discern that because it's a much pinker, a uniform pinker stone. The East Longmeadow is a very orange stone. So yeah, visually you can do it. Ultimately, if you, if you have some that are similar, you've got to put them under the microscope or, or do SEM analysis of them. We have a brownstone basement. What is the best? My way? condolences. Yeah, I'm here. I think it's too late. Um, what's the best way to deal with the water? You're, you're talking about your, your foundation? Our, our, yes, the floor below the ground, the bottom floor. You're, you're completely underground. Yeah. Jack. <laughs> How's that IRA? Oh. <laughs> the best way to deal with it is to excavate where you can on the exterior and install a waterproofing membrane on the exterior. Nothing you can do to the interior is going to help you keep water out. It needs to breathe into the basement? Sorry? It needs to breathe into the basement You area. need to keep the water that's coming in from the exterior out of the stone. And there's going to be water that's being sucked into the stone through capillary action too. You'll never be able to stop that unless you undercut the foundation. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I work for the National Park Service, and here in the city we have a few of our own brownstone buildings. Yes, you do. And brownstone sculptures and other things. And when we started a high school to try and educate the future contractors and craft people about Thank you. the future. You're welcome. Okay. <laughs> Question? Is it working? Yeah. Yes. Sorry. Um, what efforts are you doing to to educate contractors, giving them the benefit of the doubt that they are trying to do the right thing. What are you doing to educate them, but also the homeowners, who make your Portland cement or stucco. At least those words become uh, you know, a point of further conversation or further clarification without the saying, okay, so we use the Portland cement. Well, one of the things that I'm hoping to do is there might be a few contractors in this room. When, when we're called on to a, a project, we're the architects. We're the, we're the cake decorators. Okay. So, what 
essentially what we end up doing is ensuring that contractors who don't know what they're doing don't end up working on our clients' buildings. That doesn't always work because if I have somebody like Jack or I have somebody like West New York who know what they're doing, their bid is always going to be three times higher than some clown in a, in a truck with a couple of dogs and a, and a you know. And so our job really is essentially what we end up doing is weeding out the bad contractors and trying to educate the client, not the contractor, to use an appropriate contract. And then hopefully those contractors get more work and get more work and the knuckleheads get weeded out. We <laughs> see the guys in the truck and the dogs. <laughs> you know, I hope they find something else to do. And I think there's an appropriate place for it. Yeah, and I do think that we won't talk about that. Right. For the case with the limestone, with, with the brownstone below grade, uh, do they use like a sacrificial mortar layer, like a lime mortar layer? Is that common, like even brick? Typically what, what we do, and when I say typically, we've only had clients who were wealthy enough to undertake something like this maybe eight times. We, we install a, a bentonite layer against the stone. We, we put a lime mortar smoothing coat on. We put a bentonite layer against that. We put filter fabric on the outside of that, and then gravel on the outside of that. And, and try to carry, you try to actually take it out to a, a city drain pipe. And you'll use a bank A, a sacrificial layer just means that the next homeowner is going to have to deal with it. If that's all you put they, on they the They can last pretty long time. <laughs> We're here. <laughs> uh, patchy material. Yeah. Okay, when you've lost so much material, say two or three inches off of the face of the, of the brownstone. Uh, I know you mentioned the uh, the Portland patch, excuse me, Portland patching material that had, you know, does not absorb the water. Does not allow the water to pass through, so everything else around it deteriorated. Now we've used products on our our projects to rebuild, have the the grass one come out and re uh, carve the the face of the stuff. Not to push any materials out there, but what's your feeling on patching? Rebuilding the brownstone so that you don't lose. We do it. The integrity of the. We building. use we use composite we use composite materials and you know I I, I wish I could give a three hour talk on this. Um, you know when we did the Church of, of the Incarnation for example we we had that's actually that's Haberstraw stone and we we couldn't find that anywhere we ended up getting a bridge abutment from New Jersey and using that for stone replacement. But depending on where the stone is located on a building and the depth of the deterioration, the depth of the delamination, we, we will call for a number of different things. We'll call for retooling. If it's, if it's less than a half an inch, we'll actually have them come back and retool the surface of the stone. If it's more than that, we have them take it back to good stone and if it's in a place where it might fall and end up embedded in someone's skull, we'll typically call for a stone Dutchman. The same stone, a Dutchman installed in that place. If it's worse than that, we'll call for a full stone replacement. If it's in a protected area where it might fall off and end up in a garden, we'll use composite patching material. And, and there are a couple of companies that, that make stuff. I don't want to promote any particular company, but there are companies that make appropriate matching materials. But again, typically the guy with a van and the two dogs doesn't know about them. Somebody like West New York knows who somebody like Jack knows who these, who these people are. And so typically on, a, on any building, we'll, we'll end up with an entire regimen of, of different treatments and, and what we'll do on a brownstone building, you have to make a census of each stone and you have to tell the contractor exactly what happens to each stone. All right, thank you. Sure. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you so much. Nice to have you.